Hello, my name is Savannah Larson and I'm a Nordic Research Specialist in the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. Today we will be talking about Swedish research and how to get started in your Swedish research. The objectives of my class today are to help you learn the basic history of Sweden when it comes to the records that you will find for your ancestors. Understand the basic research strategy and how to find records and also understand what resources are available for you when you need help. The first basic date to keep in mind when doing your Swedish family history is 1686. In 1686, a law was passed requiring parish records to be kept. Um, this was the first time that there is widespread record keeping across the entire country. Though not all parishes began record keeping at this point, or if they did, they may not have preserved them to be accessible today. Um, and in some areas, there may be records earlier than this date. If you understand that this date was when parish records were required by law, you can understand the basic time frame of when you can expect to find your ancestor in parish records. Parish records are going to be the main source of information when you do Swedish genealogy. Everything was kept by the church. That means if you're looking for a vital record or a census, it's most likely going to come in a form that was kept by the church. The basic records that you can expect to see in every church are household records, which end up being the foundation of your research. Like census records in the U.S., household records create a kind of frame or the bones of your research, which you can use other records to kind of flesh out. Then you have the basic birth, marriage, and death records, as well as moving records. This will allow you to trace your family throughout their entire life, um, even from parish to parish, fairly easily, as long as the records are there and accessible record types in mind, let's walk through the basic research cycle. As with any research project, you want to start with what you know. For example, known information would be considered, I know the birthplace of this individual, or I know where they were married. I know where they had their kids and about when they had their kids. You want to start with known information so that you can anchor yourself in a time and place and know where to look for records going forward. Using that known information, you want to try and locate a vital record. A vital record would be the basic birth, marriage, or death records for somebody in your family. If for some reason you can't find one for the ancestor you're researching, I suggest moving forward a generation and maybe looking for their kids in vital records and then trying to push back once you find a little bit more information. From that vital record, I would locate a farm name or a neighborhood name. These are really important when it comes to Swedish research because that's how you find the household record information, which gives you the bulk of your information that you're going to be using for your research. So the vital record will typically list a farm name, and then you want to figure out that farm name and be able to find it in the household records from there. Once you find one household record using a farm name, then you want to try and find the rest of the household records and piece together the story of the person's life. And once you find all of the household records, if for some reason they move, you want to use what are called moving records. These aren't always available, but for the time period that they are, they're kind of crucial to research. If somebody is moving, then usually the priest will make a note of it in the household record. And then if there's a moving record, you can also look there to see where they moved to. And then you can look in the parish they moved to to see where in the household records you can find them later. So they're also a very important step in helping you do your research. After you found all of the household records and kind of trace this person through their life, then you can verify the vital information and start the cycle back over again with what you know and then move to what you need to know. The next thing to mention on the history timeline isn't so much a specific year, but a kind of time frame, and that would be the 1820s. This is when handwriting started to transition from a very interesting Gothic style that looks kind of like this, which for a lot of people is super overwhelming. Um, and it requires you to do a little bit more research and a little bit more learning on the back end to be able to read. 
and it transitions in the 1820s to a more Latin style that you see here, um, where it's a little bit easier for somebody to just pick up and read without any background experience in Sweden at all. There are still elements of Gothic that you can see in this image, but it's a lot easier for somebody to read and it's a lot easier to pick up on those little things as you go. The next landmark time frame is the 1830s, and this is when immigration started to pick up in Sweden and people were starting to leave to America and other places around the world. So chances are your ancestor likely moved to America or someplace around the world from Sweden around the 1830s or between the 1830s and the 1920s. And this is when you're starting your research. And so that is a good kind of time period to understand when it comes to just the general culture of emigration at the time. 1840 is a good date to remember because that's when you can start to access indexes for household exams. Before 1840, you really need to know the farm name of your ancestor to easily find them in household exams. But after 1840, if you can't find the farm name, that's okay. You can usually have some pretty good success in finding them as long as you have their name and, and an exact birth date. Um, these indexes can be found on Archive Digital and MyHeritage. Um, but similar indexes can also be found on Family Search and the Swedish National Archive starting in 1860. So between 1840 and 60, you have to pay for a subscription in order to access the indexes. But after that, um, there are other sites that have them available as well. There are also record indexes for birth, marriage, and death records throughout the country during this time period. It is important to keep in mind that these record indexes are not complete. So if you search in the record indexes for a birth, marriage, or death, and don't find your ancestor, don't think that they're not there because they likely are. They likely just aren't indexed at this time. So you may have to go through the book page by page or look for a little bit more information before finding your ancestor in those records. As we're talking about household record indexes, I do want to issue a warning. In about 1865, the church teamed up with tax authorities to create a record of missing persons. This was for more tax reasons, and it was easiest for the tax authorities to do this in line with the church, who was already keeping records of all of its people. This is important to note because your ancestor may turn up in one of these lists, which was usually kept in the household examination book, and you may think they're still alive or in the parish when they actually aren't. From about 1865 to about 1894, you will see these show up in the household record indexes, so you just have to be a little bit careful about checking to make sure they're not in this list instead of a normal household record list. You can do this by looking at the top of the page for something that looks like this. Obefintlighetsregister or Obefintliga. If you see something that looks a little bit like that, it means that they were on this record of missing persons and not on a normal household examination record. The last thing to note on our history timeline is the date 1895. This isn't a big deal, but it is something to keep in mind as you're doing your research. In 1895, the household examination record turned into what we call the congregation book. And there's not a huge difference in the way the record was taken. In a lot of ways, it's very similar. It mostly just took out all of the religious aspects of the original household examination record. So instead of asking religious questions, the for Shamling's book or the congregation book to, keeps track of mostly just the vital information and moving information when it comes to the family. The easiest way to access all of the church records is to go to Family Search first and use the research wiki. So if you click on search and then go to research wiki, once you get to the research wiki, you can type in Sweden and click on Sweden genealogy. Once you get to the Sweden genealogy page, if you go onto the right side of the page and look for church records, this will open the Sweden church records page. Here, the wiki team has created two tables. The first is a table of indexed collections, where it shows you the different websites that collections are available on and gives you links to easily access the indexes um, on those specific websites.
The second table on the Church Records Wiki page is for browsable image collections. Here, it, it's very similar, where you can see the different repositories on the left, and then it gives you a date range and a link so that you can click on a, a specific website's um, collection and go there quickly. Here, when you click on the collection, you will need to type in the name of the parish. And this is pretty similar across all of the websites. So you'll type in the name of the parish, and then choose the parish that you're looking for. And then it will bring up a list of collections. And you can see the type of record, the time frame, and then you have the option to open them, where you can browse page by page through the record. An important thing to note about the archives that I'd wish I'd known a lot sooner is that there is a common thread throughout all of the archives that they use the same letter coding for all of their different records. Um, for example, household examination records use the AI code. So if you see AI in front of something in Swedish that you don't understand, you can know that it's a household examination record. Similarly, moving records use the code, letter code B. Birth records use the letter code C. Marriage records use the letter code E. Death records use the letter code F. Knowing this about the letter coding may help you a lot, especially if you don't know the language, to navigate those archive websites from the wiki page without having to spend a lot of time translating everything on the page. Now that we've talked about research strategy and history, the next thing we want to talk about are some basic research tools. These are the things that I like to keep on hand while I'm doing Swedish research that just aid my research a little bit and make things go a little bit smoother and faster. The first of my favorite tools is called Ortnamsregistrat. This is where I like to go when I am trying to figure out a place name and the document I'm reading doesn't quite say it clearly. Here you can come and choose the county that you're working in. So they've got a big list of counties. Also, side note, the, the counties also have a letter code. So if you choose your county and then you just type in the Ortnam box the letters that you know using a percent sign as a wild card. And then you choose the parish that you're in and click Suck down at the bottom. It will open a list of the different farms in that area that have that um, approximate spelling or have those letters. So here, for example, I searched for one that started with B and I got nine results of farms in that parish that start with B. And this can really help if you can't read the writing super well and need to try and figure out what parish you're looking for. Another great tool, especially if you don't know the language, is the Swedish genealogy word list. You can access that by clicking on search and then going down to the research wiki. Once you're at the research wiki, type in Sweden and then click on Swedish genealogy or Sweden genealogy. Once you're here in the top, it has a list of research tools and the one you want to click on is the Swedish word list. Here you have a word list that is created specifically for genealogy um, that can help you as you're trying to read the records. I typically click control F and a little box will appear in the top right corner and then I type in the word that I'm trying to find. And it will bring me specifically to the words that look similar so I can try to figure out what my record is saying based on the, the definitions that are here. And then for those words that don't show up in the word list, you think you see a little bit of a story or something that's not quite coming out the way you want it to, I suggest going to the Swedish genealogy guide. Here, there's a historical dictionary database that if you go to the main page, click on dictionaries and then choose the SHDD, you can search with the beginning of the word, the middle of the word, or the end of the word. It also has little letter, like little tiles that you can click for the special letters in the Swedish alphabet. So if you can only read a few of the letters on the on the word, you can just type in like an F 
it begins with an F and ends with a D and then click search. And it will bring up all of the words that match those criteria from a historical dictionary, which is more likely to have the correct definition and more likely to have the word um, that you are seeing in your historical records. If you're new to Swedish research and feeling super overwhelmed about reading records or battling translations, don't worry. There are so many ways to get help for free online. You can start by going to the Family Search Communities page at community.familysearch.org, where you can access, access volunteers and researchers who can give you pointers and translation help, not only in Swedish, but in several different languages and areas around the world. You can also join groups on Facebook that offer similar services, or even sign up for a free research consultation with a specialist at the Family History Library, like myself, where we can give you research strategies that will help you to get started in your research journey. To just quickly recap what we've talked about today, we went through the basic history of Sweden as it pertains to the records that were created for ancestors. We also talked about the research strategy uh, for basic research in Sweden and also how to find records using the Family Search Wiki. I also gave you a few of my favorite resources that I like to use when I'm doing research in Sweden. There was a lot that I wasn't able to mention today, so I created a Pinterest board for this class where I left links to different forums, blogs, articles, and tools that may be helpful to you in your research. I encourage you to check it out and maybe bookmark it as a quick reference to help you as you research. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to use the Roots Tech chat feature on this page. I'd like nothing more to, than to hear from you as you interact with my content today. Good luck in your research and have a great day.